All right, so we're recording on the Canon R5C and we're recording in 8K RAW right now, so I better make this quick before I fill up an entire terabyte. <laughs> Just make things a little more interesting. I have the A7S III next to it in 4K mode. Oh, this is my opportunity right here. Well, at least if I get hit by a car, we'd have it recorded in 8K, so that would be some pretty high quality footage right there. But anyways, how does it look when we crop the cameras in by let's say 3X? or so. Maybe we can try a 5x zoom in. Is it sharper on the AK? I sure hope so with all the data that I'm burning through right now. Hope it looks pretty good. <laughs> Just to really see if there's a difference. Let's go 10x. Let's do that. Anyways, let's see what kind of questions you guys have in the comments. Why have you disappeared? Well, actually the first half of the month, I was actually in Germany with Ari, taking a little tour of the headquarters. But yeah, we were just over there, just taking care of some really important, you know, serious business and being professional and all. Your hair looks stupid. What do you mean? Looks like a dumb face. You said my hair looks like a dumb face? Yeah, My face it. is not a dumb face. What are you talking about? I said it was your hair. No, it's not. Come here, you son of a... <laughs> <laughs> R5C versus the famous incubator. Uh, good news is that the fan works and it works well at 8K60. I had it in there at 104 degrees Fahrenheit and it was just like, I think it's getting a little toasty. I shall turn on the fan cooled off while the R5 would have just melted into a puddle of sadness during that time. Derek Crowder says, have you used the Tascam caxlr D2 with it? Basically, that's like the top handle that you can attach to the top of the R5C and it gives you phantom powered XLR ports, which is awesome that we get that in Canon now because the Sony's have had that for a little while. It comes with the FX3 and also Panasonic, like other guys have been doing that, but now we can do that with the Canon R5C making this mirrorless camera accept professional level microphones. Cam, they're pretty legit, so I imagine it's a solid thing. Did you fall in love? Uh, kinda actually. At first I was like, okay, it's a Canon R5, but you get no IBIS and a fan, and it costs an extra thousand dollars, but there's actually quite a bit more to it. So the more I used it, the more I, yeah, kind of fell in love with it. Does it have 10-bit color? Yeah, actually pretty much all the formats have 10-bit internally, which is nice. You're definitely gonna want that if you're gonna shoot C-Log3. There is an H.264 format that is 8-bit, but if you try to switch it over to there, it basically gives you a little warning that you shouldn't do that because there's just not enough data in that 8-bit codec to contain all that color information. And the RAW is actually a 12-bit codec, so you get extra, extra color information. Grayseb says, can you mount it on a drone? I think we could make that happen. How's it feel? Amazing. This is the Canon R5C on okay. here and they removed the IBIS. Why do you guys not like IBIS? Because you Ooh. get that this. Yeah, we don't this. like this. Even if you turn it off, it's still gonna move a little bit. There's no way to actually lock that. A lot of people are actually like putting glue or something in there to lock it in place. That sounds kind of sketchy though. It is very sketchy, <laughs> especially glue. Just go by a tree and like whip around it or something like that. That'll show us some rolling shutter right there. You go lower. Yeah, I think that should show us right there. Yeah, it actually holds really well. When you're doing those hard, big movements, those things could take a big toll on like the image, you know? Yeah. And this thing is holding right now really nice. Yeah, look at that. Like that, that's, that, dude, that was a great shot. Yeah. Wanna shoot the next one 4K 120? Yeah, let's do it. So we like the full frame, the 8K Woo! raw. I don't see any rolling shutter. Yeah. I love the 120. I'm gonna I'm gonna be using that 120. Top it off, you already know the canning colors are great. Yeah. We had IBIS and those hard movements like that, you'll see it. Yeah. Like yeah. when we're shooting it. Yeah. Especially like we do a lot of that too. Like yeah. especially like chasing cars and stuff. Or There's like a talent. lot of like aggressive moves that we have to make to like keep in there and stay with the car. Weight is always a big factor in, especially flying these FPV drones. It felt so light. It felt just I could just whip that thing around. I actually feel like you guys are gonna get it now. <laughs> we, we probably are, we will. will. I'm yeah. being dead serious. I almost guarantee that we'll probably we'll get that. Now huge thank you to DJI for sponsoring this episode. I genuinely love it when a brand that I love and regularly use all the time sponsor these videos, support this channel, make this all possible, and allow us to hang out in these really epic balconies. I mean, what, where, what, where are we? Look at this, Jesus. So this is the RS3 Pro gimbal at the core. It's a great addition to the R5C because without that IBIS, if you wanna stabilize it, you wanna put it on 
nice little gimbal like this. Now there is also the RS3, which is the smaller version of this gimbal, and it can support the weight just fine, but once you add like a bigger lens and all that stuff, and you try to get a shot like this, you might have an issue where it bumps that eyepiece. So R5C's best friend is gonna be the RS3 Pro. My favorite feature is the auto lock feature. So you're shooting and then now you're locked, you can transport it, you can unlock one thing at a time to do the balance. And when you're ready to shoot again, you just tap it and you're ready to go again. On the sides here are the DJI side handles. So you don't need it, but it definitely is nice to have a dual grip. It just makes it a little bit easier to manage. And this is DJI's extension arm. So I can actually lock this one right here in this position. So now I can go into briefcase mode. And then these straps right here are attachments for a ready rig, which is the ideal way to hold a gimbal for an extended period of time. It also absorbs a little bit of that Z axis. We've got a manual focus lens right here and I can adjust that focus from right here. I left the tilt the cage on here for now because the bottom is an Arca Swiss plate. So it actually slides right into the base plate for the RS3, which is really nice and convenient. But if you wanted to go ultra light, you could of course remove that. But I just want to be able to slide this on and off of the rig as fast as I can. And then we go up top here and this is the DJI wireless mic receiver, which is something I've been using a ton lately. And this is the microphone that you're listening to right now. It's very easy to clip it on but you can of course just plug in a wireless microphone and tuck it under your shirt if you're trying to conceal it but it also records internally and the latest firmware update is actually really nice because they make it so that you can lock this record button so if this is in your pocket and you accidentally bump it it doesn't cut recording and then of course our micro hdmi which is still the saddest thing about this camera but that gets fed down to this dji wireless transmitter now even though we're going hdmi in here we can still output an sdi signal so this can also be used as a way to convert the signal, which is nice, especially if you have a monitor that only takes SDI. FPV guys love the thing. By far the best thing I ever used in my life, dude. Really, yeah. in terms of transmission, it's I mean, like transmission, pretty significant. range, latencies, this is like unheard of. I mean, we lose like video first from our um, actual FPV before this thing does. Yeah. So, so if anything, I can just fly back with this thing. <laughs> I'm not giving you this back. You tell me what DJI wants and I'll do it you know what this thing is amazing bro so it looks like we have a dual native iso on here so base iso at 800 and 3200 but here it's not super obvious what the difference between the two base sensitivities are but if i go to iso 6400 definitely start to see a difference especially once we start to take a close up look and if we add a little bit of gain to the image you could definitely see that there's way more noise going on in the lower base iso so it definitely helps i must say i really like how the colors look on this i mean just look just look at the screen doesn't it look nice oh just, yeah like, it does look really good really great yeah that's the nice thing about canon is sometimes you know okay time to okay go. time to go it's about to be fourth of july and uh you know i love fourth of july i love fireworks but the dogs definitely do not so it's time to get back and put some earmuffs on the dogs is that better <laughs> and now let's go ahead and try a little bit higher here we're at twelve thousand eight hundred now I rarely find myself needing to go past 12,800, even if I'm on a somewhat slow lens. Right now I'm actually at f4, because if this looks decent, I'll be fairly satisfied. It's actually lighter than it looks, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The body is 1.7 pounds, so it's just like barely heavier than the R5. Yeah, and now seeing it in person, the fan really doesn't look as big. Does it get in the way of the eyepiece? No, 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 it's cool. You're actually thinking about getting this camera, right? Yeah, 100%. You're a big Canon guy. You've never made the switch over to Sony, even though we were telling you how cool Sony well, was. Well, I actually came close, but when Canon announced their 28 to 72.0 lens, I stuck with Canon. Yeah. That's just what happened. Uh, I'm more of a lens guy first than a camera guy. Oh, do you have that lens with you? Three pounds of glass. <laughs> oh yeah, that lens is way heavier than the camera. Three pounds. Canon EOS R and R5C feels somewhat similar? Yeah, it feels the same. In photos, it looks huge, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it does, it does, but it's really not that much bigger. Cause like the Canon C70, that's a heavier camera. I try to overheat the thing. Oh, you tried? Yeah. And were you successful? No. And that's another reason why I didn't ever upgrade it to the R5. I've had my, back in the day, my 7D Mark II overheat on me in the middle of uh, the ceremony. And that was a nightmare. And I don't ever want to experience anything like that. Yeah. If you shoot an interview, or like live event or any of that stuff. It's like, yeah, you're shooting long takes. But this, this pretty much has everything that I, I want because I've already pushed the Canon R to its limits, man. Like big time. That Canon R looks at me and is like, 
No more, Frank, please, no more. <laughs> By the way, do you like how I'm just filming this behind the scenes video with a Sony Venice 2? With a, what, like a $80,000 camera? <laughs> we got a couple more questions here. What is the max resolution and frame rate it can shoot? So we got 8K 30 in RAW ST, but we can go into the more compressed LT and get 60 frames per second in 8K 12 bit. But we could also go down to 4K in XFABC or H.265 and get 120 frames per second in 4K, which still gives us nice 10 bit quality. But the thing to keep in mind about the 8K 60 in the raw LT mode is that the camera's using so much power, it actually can't supply power to the lens as well. So that means you're going to lose the autofocus, a lot of times the manual focus even because that runs off power and even aperture control. So something to keep in mind, if you're running manual lenses like this, it doesn't really affect you at all. But there's also workarounds like this tilt -a cage has a power delivery USB-C port. If I plug that in to here, then I can go ahead and supply Apply enough power to run the lens as well as the camera. Adam says, how many new hard drives did you need to get just for the 8K video? Yes, these file sizes, not light, but good thing is it actually tells you the data rate right here, which is kind of nice. So let me get out of the sun so you can see the screen a little bit better. So let's say we're in HEVC or H.265 at 10 bit 4K. 24, we can get 100 megabits per second right there. That's gonna give us 674, that's over 10 hours on this memory card. Now I do have this pretty big ass memory card in here. This is 512 gigabytes, so half a terabyte. This is an Angelbird memory card, by the way. And I actually really dig these. These are less expensive than the SanDisk cards, but they're super fast. Actually, this is the card that I have the least amount of issues with in like the ProRes heavy files with like the G8 and the transfer speeds are good. And it's actually a very well trusted brand. Like you check out Aries website for memory cards, angel birds all over there. But this one has been pretty bulletproof so far. So I'm gonna try to put some more mileage behind angel bird memory cards. And so far I've only really used SanDisk, but maybe I'll start using them. And then we can jump up to like XFABC 10 bit in intro codec is gonna be a bit more data. And one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting is that you could actually go all the way up to 8K in H265, a little over two hours on this 512 gig memory card. But once we go into raw, that's where we start eating down to 42 minutes on 512 gigs. Or if I go down to LT, that's gonna give me 65 minutes, which is great. But if I go up to 60, 26 minutes, is all I get out of this 512 gig memory card. Oh my gosh, I'm terrified. This is almost as scary as this angle. Obviously there's a difference in quality when you go between the 4K compressed to 8K compressed to 8K raw, but when it comes to the amount of data you can get away with just this compressed H.265 HEVC, I'm pretty happy with how it comes out. Marco asks why they make it and what sets it apart? Well, let's go ask Canon. The way that I see it is that the R5 is a really great photo camera, excellent photo camera that can record really nice video. This is a cinema camera that can also create really beautiful photos. This is a cinema camera first. And so that's why we took out that IBIS. You know, Canon revolutionized the industry with the uh, 5D Mark II. I remember, Everybody yeah. started off with a 7D 5D Mark II. T2i was my first T2i? Canon because I was yeah. like, oh, I love that 5D, but yeah. at the time I was just like, it's too expensive. But then the T2i came out, I was like, yeah. that's the one. The DSLR form factor is something that a lot of creators have gotten used to. And that switch right there, that's revolutionary for Canon. There's a photo and video switch. When you go into photo mode, it's exactly how you would see in the R5. But when you go to the video mode, it's exactly how you'd see on a C70 or a C300 Mark III. So the button layout is actually exactly the same as the R5. The biggest difference is that now with the numbered buttons, that allows us to actually reprogram this to over a hundred different features. Just like the C70, they're all numbered. So exactly. you just say button number nine, exactly. make it that. Oh. So I could put false color here, exactly. waveform here, yep. different autofocus modes there. Okay, cool. I don't know if you know this, but to reprogram any of the buttons, all you have to do is hold menu and the button. Oh, and together? So you don't, yeah, together. And oh then you don't gosh. have to jump into. That would save me awesome. so much time if you told yes. me this two years ago. <laughs> What's the frame rate on this thing? I think it's like 12 frames per second in mechanical or 20 electronic. So if I want to go into video mode and I want to record a little bit of video. What's your uh, ISO at? Uh, 3200. 3200. 
at right. 2.0. Can we try slow motion? So to do slow-mo, we would just change that to with audio, right? So that's just regular, cool. slow and fast, but there. And then you would just hit this and then pick your frame rate. Oh, you awesome. do 120. And then since your shutter speed is at 180 degrees, it should automatically just set it where it's supposed to be. ISO 16,000. Ooh. Ooh, you got the finale in 120p. Perfect time to film 120. We got something, we got something. We I, got I like something? this, yeah. All right. Your battery? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> It does go through battery pretty quick, huh? How's the camera feel? It feels just like my Canon R. Just like with a lot of horsepower. With a lot of more, yeah, more features. <laughs> when I'm in photo mode, there's no way to record anything if I hit the record button, huh? No, nothing happens. I don't think so. No, nothing happens. So you would just have to do the switch over, yeah. but the switch over, how many seconds is that? We counted. And go. One, two, three, four, five, six. So, okay, like around six, okay. seven, yeah, yeah. Will the waveforms remain on there when I'm recording? Yeah, so go ahead, I programmed it right here. You get waveform and false color, peaking, like all the tools that you would generally get, zebra if you want it. And that's the downside with the Canon R. It has a nice little histogram, uh -huh. but as soon as you hit record, that histogram goes away. Oh, dang. It was right here, dude. Yeah, yeah I jumped a little bit on that one. Same here, man. <laughs> now the real question. How does that R5C compete with my iPhone? iPhone 13 Pro Max or 12,800 ISO on the R5C? This has more of a cinematic look. I don't think so, Look brother. at the, the, the doff. I'm actually oh. impressed with Ooh, the stabilization. Look at the focus. See that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focus? Yeah, yeah. It seems, to be honest, from this right now, that the R performs better in autofocus. In autofocus. I think so. In yes. video. Yeah, I think in so. Video. Yeah. Sony's autofocus smokes it now. Oh. In terms of video autofocus, okay. Sony's autofocus Smokes it. Let's take some pictures of this gentleman right here. Here, if I want to skip ahead all the way to the end of the clip, I can just scrub to the end of the clip. And that saves me so much time. Sony, you can't do that. You can do like a fast forward, double speed. You can like switch memory cards here. And depending on what kind of file you're recording, there's different indexes that you can switch between. But if we pull this up now, the only thing is I wish I could see this with a lot applied. I'm kind of stuck with looking at the C-Log. You could even swipe for next clip. Next clip. How did you even fit this lens in your bag this whole time? Here we go, look at this. This is 800 millimeter? Teleconverter or no? No teleconverter. Oh, okay, just straight 800. Now I would say the most impressive thing about this camera is how versatile it is. I mean, small enough to photograph vacations, you can vlog with it, and you can use it as like a B cam to like a C500 Mark II in the cinema world. But the RF mount is also very versatile. So of course you have your RF lenses, but you can adapt it to EF lenses. And since they're both Canon, you have really good control over it. And you could also use a PL mount adapter to adapted to some cinema lenses if we want to utilize some super 35 mil lenses because of the pixel density we can still extract a solid 6k image out of here uh, you may have noticed i've been experimenting with some anamorphic lenses on here because we have anamorphic settings all right so how about the things i don't love about the camera well i love that it can de-squeeze anamorphic on here but it gives you a 1.3 a 1.8 and a 2.0 so only three so this is a well, random 1.6. Okay, this is kind of odd, but this is a 1.5. So I'd love to get a firmware update where we have more squeeze options. I would also say the autofocus in video just doesn't feel as good as where it used to be. And I've tried adjusting all the different speed and sensitivity options and the face only options. And I feel like it's safe to say now that in video, at least the Sony autofocus is superior. And then of course there's battery life. So this is one of the older ones you could tell because the new ones have this gold square somewhere on it. And that gives you a little bit more capacity. So that definitely helps. But when I ran my battery test, I got about an hour of recording out of it. And with the older battery, I was getting about 47 minutes. And in 8K60, it told me I was only gonna get maybe 32 minutes of battery life, but I actually ended up getting 58 minutes on 8K60 raw. So honestly, that's pretty good. But I think the reason why it feels like it has a really short battery life is because even when you're not recording, it's on standby and you have it on. I think it's still doing a lot of processing and it just kills this battery. And also you need a certain amount of voltage to run this camera. So even if you have some charge left in there, 
I won't let you really turn on and record. So of course, for anything serious, you're gonna wanna find a good power solution. So this is Tilta's solution here to power it off V-mount. So USB-C comes out of here and goes into the side of the camera. But right now I actually have it powered off this core power base. That way I can just send a dummy battery up to here so that there's less things hanging off the side. And here's another solution from Tilta. These are side handles that use like the Sony batteries in here and you can power the camera off from just the side grip, which is a nice little solution there. So a lot of different ways to power the thing. Now I am liking the image and colors coming out of this camera. It's very easy and flexible to work with, but what I don't like is that in the compressed format like XFIVC and AC65, basically everything except for RAW, we only get C-Log3. We do not get C-Log2, and they say it's because C-Log3 is easier to work with, but when you want to shoot in the RAW 8K modes or you know the 8K60, then that's RAW, which debayers to C-Log2. So now you have two different color things to work with, color things. I'm so legit. I mean, honestly, if you do your color management correctly, they're really not that hard to match, but it would have been nice if they just gave us C-Log2 in the compressed format so we can shoot a project and we can hand it off to the editor and just say, everything C-Log2. Instead of saying the raw clips are C-Log3, but there's a few high speed shots that we have to go into C-Log3 and so you have to make sure, you know what I mean? I mean, C-Log3 is fine, but C-Log2 does give us a bit more access to dynamic range, especially down there in the shadow. So, you know, in Sony, S-Log3, has more dynamic range. In Canon, C-Log2 actually has more dynamic range. Now, as we mentioned, there's no IBIS in here, but there is that same digital image stabilization in here. And honestly, it's a pretty good image stabilization and it crops into the image 1.1X, I believe. But one of the things I was hoping to see is for it to analyze the gyro data instead of analyzing the image. And there is actually a digital bubble level in here. So there's obviously gyro information going on in there. So that, that is nice because that's fairly new for Canon. But when I did my extreme close-up shots to test out the image stabilization, I was still seeing that weird funky effect telling me that it is not using the gyro information, which is a total bummer. Bad news, it still tracks the image. Oh, it's still, okay. Yeah. Well, it's no big deal, that's fine. But one thing that I actually thought was kind of cool is there's like a custom button that you can program. So one of them I programmed to temporarily disable the image stabilization. So you could actually do that while recording. While recording. Yeah, so I've been doing some tests where I would record and as soon as I start seeing that weird tracking, like the, the face tracking feature, that like TikTok dance thing, you know, yeah, where it like- The background's like bouncing yeah, around. Yeah, exactly. Once I start seeing that effect come in, I just hit that button and I hold it for the duration yeah. of yeah that shot so that I don't have to cut. It really only happens when I start zooming into someone and it's just cropping into the person. And during the reception, if the people are like dancing and jumping up and down, that's where I notice it. Is yeah, when they're jumping? dancing, yeah, they're jumping yeah. and it locks on the person and the background's bouncing and the person's like standing still and it looks weird. So I have to kind of widen it again. Right. right, let me go ahead and get myself in focus here. So we're talking dynamic range now. So I'm in the shadow, background is really bright and sometimes you get bright windows in the background or you get a bright foreground. Generally, dynamic range is a good thing to have. So comparing it against an actual cinema camera like the Arri Alexa, it is the original Alexa classic, which is really outdated, but that doesn't change the fact that it is still a beast in dynamic range. And if we go three stops over, we can easily still recover. Carrie still looks good in both, but if we go four stops over, Carrie's hat's clipping a little bit. She is getting hit by direct sunlight. There is a skylight over there. And then five stops over, obviously the Alexa is doing better, but still, I mean, the R5C doesn't look that bad considering it's like a fraction of the size but even with Alexa's older sensor, it is still a beast in highlights because six stops over. So this is definitely the breaking point for the R5C. Skin tones don't look good. Espresso machine in the background is definitely botched out. And then if we go in the opposite direction of shadows here, we go two stops underneath. So slightly underexposed shot here and we can still bring it up. And we do bring up some noise along with it, but you know, R5C is not looking bad there. And then if we go three stops under, they're both definitely noisy at this point. And then just going crazy all the way to minus five stops will bring it up just to get an idea of what the noise pattern looks like when you shoot something way down in that dark pocket of the sensor. McDuff Photo says, how much raw do you find yourself shooting and how do you deal with the noise? Now, me personally, I'm almost always shooting 
4K because that's all I need. 8K is the best results, but often it's a bit unnecessary for what I'm trying to do at least. 8K and H.265 seems like a pretty solid middle ground where you're still getting that 8K, but in a highly compressed format. But the thing to keep in mind about the 8K and H.265 is that you are gonna max out at 30 frames per second. Now, when it comes to dynamic range, is it better to shoot it raw? And I would say yes, at the edges of the sensor, you definitely get a little bit more color information. Like if you look at the skies, I just get more blue out of the raw. I've been shooting a ton in just H.265 and I'm satisfied with the amount of dynamic range I'm getting out of that for the most part. And then how do we deal with the noise? When it comes to exposing, one of the things I really, really like about this camera is that it has false color built in so I can activate it and get a really good idea of what's within my exposure. And as soon as I see the red, I know it's clipping. So I can actually shoot with a lot of confidence and really place my subject in the part of the sensor I want. So for example, this shot here, I'm actually shooting this shot overexposed. So here's the original and I just bring it down. And the reason why I do that is so that I don't have to sit down here in the darker part of the sensor where I would have to deal with more noise. Whole oh, this is a big ass bug. Is the LPE battery ideal for video shoots or do you just have to rig it up? It really depends on what you're trying to shoot. I mean, if you're gonna put it on a FPV drone or you wanna fly it on a gimbal and you're trying to keep it lightweight, then it's definitely awesome being able to just swap out the battery once an hour and have a super lightweight rig. But times like right now, it is very nice being able to just power it off of V-mount and get hours and still be able to power this transmitter and this all off of this one battery. I should also mention, dedicated time code right there heck yeah so tentacle sync jamming the time code right there like these tentacle syncs can jam sync to something like my a7 IV but the problem with that is that it takes up the microphone port but here with the dedicated port it's like a professional camera where it's just gonna take that time code and throw it in the metadata so how do you protect the micro hdmi and usb cables when you're shooting handheld so canon does actually provide a little lock that mounts onto the side of the camera and so does tilta it comes with the cage that just kind of holds it nicely there in place i have not attached that right now because i like to live life on the edge micro hdmi definitely makes it on the list of the things i dislike about this camera the most top of the things i love about this camera has got to be the fact that you can switch between photo and video mode and it does that entire reboot because switching between photo and video it's like a different mindset right like do you ever have times where you're filming video someone comes up to you hey can you take a photo real quick and it's like okay, let me change my shutter speed and my aperture and then pull off the ND filter and let me do all that, right? It's a different mindset. It's nice being able to just and switch it completely to a different camera pretty much. Of course, the fact that you could do unlimited recording without overheating an 8K rod, that's pretty insane. But I would say the reason why I'm not gonna be using this as my daily driver has to be because of the autofocus. The autofocus in stills is great, but it's just in video. And for a lot of people, it's not that important to have great autofocus in video, especially if you're gonna use cinema lenses, then it doesn't even matter. True cinema cameras don't even have autofocus anyways. But I personally rely on autofocus all the time. Cause I mean, like, like right now I just, I'm carrying this thing around to be my autofocus. I'm my own autofocus. Oh, I forgot to mention the US USB-C port on the side of this camera, you can use it to plug into the side of the camera and charge the battery in case you misplace your battery charger for the Canon batteries or whatever. But also you can download the files off the camera in case you forget like your CFast Express Type B reader, right? But you have to use a special app. Like I wish it was like Sony where it just like comes up as a drive and you just copy paste it and do that instead of being forced into using this. But overall, super impressive stuff. The camera that I am really interested in right now actually is the Canon R7 because it's like what, 1500 bucks and you get 10 bit color which is nice. You get the IBIS, you get the Canon workflow and all that stuff. So that's been in my B&H cart on back order for a while. So eventually, okay, I know some of you already have it. How is it? Let me know in the comments, please. And I gotta go this video. Holy crap, another humongous video. I can't believe you're still here.